Hello, in this session we are going to talk about the hydrocephalus. My name is Dr. Cameron Agaev. I am a neurosurgeon. I work and practice in Istanbul, Turkey. Hydrocephalus literally means water in the head. It comes from the Greek words hydros meaning water and kephale means the head. Basically it's accumulation of the cerebrospinal fluid in the head compressing the brain. Um, normally in the brain in the skull is in the base of so-called cerebrospinal fluid. The fluid is constantly produced and constantly absorbed uh, in the skull. So within the brain there are ventricles, there are empty spaces uh, that are actually filled with this water and within these spaces uh, there is a structure we call it choroid plexus which is responsible for constant production of the cerebrospinal fluid. So the cerebrospinal fluid is produced by the choroid plexus and partly by the brain itself. It flows in the ventricles that are connected with each other, then gets out of the brain and then goes around the brain in the skull and gets reabsorbed and, or gets back into the blood circulation in the area of midline and uh, a little bit of the sides where the, uh, there are specific structures that actually get that fluid out of the skull, out of the brain, into the um, circulation. So hydrocephalus is basically accumulation, is increasing in the volume of this uh, fluid in the brain. First of all, cerebrospinal fluid is colorless, is odorless, doesn't have any taste. It's um, actually does have taste. It tastes a little bit salty because sometimes when this uh, fluid goes into the nose, the patient feel it, feel something salty coming to the throat, and uh, but it does not have any odor. It does not have any color. Uh, it looks like a tap water. Um, when we have obstruction of the flow or we have the uh, structures that um, absorb this cerebrospinal fluid uh, compromised, the fluid accumulates in the brain, the condition we call hydrocephalus. So that's a mechanism of the hydrocephalus when we have obstruction of the flow either obstruction of the flow or obstruction of the reabsorption of the fluid that actually causes building up, uh, increasing the volume of the cerebrospinal fluid in the skull. So symptoms of the hydrocephalus uh, vary in uh, small kids and in adults. So in adults and a little bit um, aged kids, uh, we have the skull is closed, it's a closed space, and that's why the extra volume of cerebrospinal fluid will cause increased pressure in the head, and for that reason, the main presenting symptom will be a headache. Uh, sometimes with advanced form of the disease we will have altered consciousness, we may have seizures and lately the level of consciousness may fall into coma and the patient may actually uh, die because of the hydrocephalus, especially if hydrocephalus is not treated promptly, so-called acute hydrocephalus. But uh, in kids, in very small kids, in very small children, when the skull is not closed, the situation is completely different. Building up the fluid actually opens up the sutures, the lines that are connecting the 
skull bones and for that reason the skull becomes bigger and bigger and bigger for that reason those babies have you know increased size of the head and uh, eventually the skull is going to close and eventually the pressure is going to happen but it usually it becomes evident at the later stage of the disease so presentation of hydrocephalus is different in in older kids and in adults rather than from from babies in adults we usually see headache and altered consciousness sometimes seizures sometimes blurred vision sometimes diplopia compromisation of the uh, sixth nerve or other nerves and in babies we see very small babies we see the head is growing up in this part we are going to talk about the treatment of the hydrocephalus so hydrocephalus cannot be treated conservatively if hydrocephalus diagnosis is made, the treatment is always surgical. So this disease, first of all, cannot be treated medically. There is no medication, there are no drugs available for treatment of hydrocephalus. There are medications that can temporarily lower the pressure, can temporarily decrease the amount of fluid production in the brain, but permanent treatment is always surgical so there are two surgical options available for these patients uh, first of them is shunting and the second is endoscopic third ventriculostomy so we will talk about the both of them later on so shunting is called uh, generally speaking as cerebrospinal fluid diversion so what do we do with the shunting? We make a small hole in the head, uh, in this area approximately, and then we place a tube into the brain cavities where there is extra fluid, extra cerebrospinal fluid. And then the tube goes down under the skin all the way down to the belly and uh, the tube ends up in the belly into the peritoneal cavity so human peritoneum is capable absorbing of lots of fluid and what we do with this shunting we take extra fluid from the brain and divert it for that reason it's called diversion and divert it to peritoneum where it's later on absorbed well, there are some nuances you know, regarding this treatment. First of all, we cannot drain all the fluid to the peritoneum. We will decrease the pressure in the brain, which will not be good. For that reason, all shunts, most of the shunt, almost all shunts, has this protection system in it. It's called valve that operates uh, based on the pressure. So when there is a pressure, particular pressure in the brain, uh, it stays closed. But when the pressure raises up, it drains extra fluid to the peritoneum and then closes again. So this way we can avoid overdraining, taking too much fluid from the brain and delivering it to the belly. The second thing is shunts are mechanical devices they can be broken they can have mechanical failures but most often we see complications like shunt infection because it's a foreign body and bugs germs can easily sit on them and then can multiply uh, the shunt infections are very very hard to treat so once you treat the infection once you give the patient antibiotics it will affect the all the body but no shunt because shunt is not living structure and there are no blood vessels there so the uh, antibiotics can cannot reach that area unfortunately so shunt infections are very very hard to treat and unfortunately shunt infections are not very infrequent for that reason we have an alternative technique we have endoscopic third ventriculostomy which allows us in some cases not all cases to 
avoid shunting. With endoscopic third ventriculostomy, we basically make a, again, small hole in the skull and then go inside the ventricular cavity with an endoscope. And within the ventricular cavity, we open up an alternative window for the cerebrospinal fluid to come out from the brain. So for that reason, ETV or endoscopic third ventriculostomy works best when there is an occlusion, when there's a compromise of cerebrospinal fluid uh, at some point. So we can go and create an alternative pass, bypass way through which the cerebrospinal fluid will come out of the brain and will eventually get reabsorbed. If we have hydrocephalus due to compromise of absorption of the cerebrospinal fluid, usually ETV ventriculostomy will not be helpful. So shunting and ETV have different uh, indications for the treatment. Shunting um, can treat all hydrocephalus, all forms of hydrocephalus, but endoscopic third ventriculostomy actually treats the obstructive hydrocephalus. The hydrocephalus is caused by the obstruction uh, in the best way. Thank you very much for watching this video regarding hydrocephalus. You can always find more information on our website.